Well, welcome, Christ Church. How you doing this morning? Uh, if you're newer here, my name is Seth. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Church. I get the privilege every week of serving uh, you with God's Word. So let's do that right now. Let's take our Bibles, if you have one. And uh, we're going to be in the book of Mar- uh, Matthew's, I was going to say Mark, uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter uh, 6 this morning. So take your Bibles and turn there. And uh, we are in uh, the middle of a series we usually uh, do some sort of standalone series at the beginning of the new year, just to try to focus our hearts and minds on truth and how to live it out in this world who is uh, going at breakneck uh, speed uh, away from the truth. We are in a series called Otherworldly, and uh, the culture is changing uh, faster than ever. Uh, the pressure is mounting. I I don't know if you felt that as a believer. I sure hope you have. There, it's, it's getting a little hard to live in a culture uh, that is going so fast and, and uh, so uh, uh, intentionally away from, away from God. And uh, we desperately, as God's people, uh, we need the truth to inform us, don't we? Uh, especially in times like this, we need the truth to inform us. That's why in the month of January, we're going to we're going to spend a few weeks in February also. We're going to dive into some passages that help frame and focus and mold us as God's people uh, who are from another world. We're, we're not from this world. We are in this world, but we are from another place. We are heavenly minded. We are God's people who live otherworldly. The Bible says strangers. The Bible says pilgrims, foreigners, aliens, exiles. So how do we live That's the question, because we're here, we live here, but we're from there, so how do we live in a culture that's moving at light speed in the opposite direction? Romans 1 talks about that, right? Romans 1 says that God has given them up. Romans 1 says these people, these people look and they rebel and they run away from God and they hate God because they don't want any authority over their lives. That's the world that we live in, and it's Hasn't been so different since Genesis 1, uh, Genesis 3, by the way. It's, we just see it. It's more accessible today. We see it uh, more visibly today. But how do we live in a culture that's moving so far away from God? That's what this series is for. In uh, Matthew chapter 6, uh, we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 15. We're going to take that in two parts. We're going we're to take 5 through 8 this morning, and then we're going to uh, conclude next week with the other half of the sermon Uh, 9 through 15. So as you're turning there, as you're getting settled, getting your notes out and pen and all that kind of stuff, let me just say this. Um, Physically, in life, there are disciplines, right? There are disciplines. We have disciplines. And the reason why they're called disciplines is because everything in your nature, uh, everything in your flesh fights against them. Like, Working out in the morning. If, if you, when your alarm grows, goes off at five five thirty, wherever, whenever you work out, if you work out, it's not like you're like, sweet, my alarm just went off. I can't wait. What do you do? You press snooze and you press snooze and you sort of accidentally, but not so much, sleep through your alarm. Uh, it, why? It's because our flesh, our our nature is fighting against. That's contrary to what we really want to do. I mean, even knowledge, I mean, you go, you know, I have a, I have a son who is in college, and, and college life for him is what's easier, social life, hanging out with friends, staying up to the wee hours of the morning, playing video games, or uh, writing a paper and studying for an exam. There are disciplines that are needed in our life, and the reason why they're called disciplines is because they go against everything in our nature, uh, fights against them. Now, spiritually, the same is true. The same is true spiritually. And prayer is the most productive thing that we can do as otherworldly people. And I was reading a sermon uh, by Charles Spurgeon this week, and he said this. He said, you didn't come before a throne of justice. You've come before a throne of grace. Isn't that great? You you, you don't come before a throne of justice. You've come before the throne of grace, and it's a throne set up on purpose for the dispensation of grace, a throne from which every utterance is an utterance of grace. Why then is 
praying so difficult, if that's true, if we don't come before God uh, in, a throne of, in his throne of justice instead of a throne of grace, why is it so hard for us to pray? It is, isn't it? I don't know if it's hard for you, but it's hard for me. How can you explain that? Why is it so hard? Because the spiritual nature of prayer is battled by our flesh. It's the reason uh, you can focus on a movie for two hours and 20 minutes, and you can barely focus on prayer for two minutes and 20 seconds. It's because our flesh wars against what our spirit is doing. And, 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 and when you're, the Bible says this, right? When you're submitting, when you're submitting your flesh to the spirit, you're actually disciplining. You're, you're going against the grain. You're, you're forcing, you're, you're pressing, you're, you're disciplining yourself. Listen, Argentina doesn't win the World Cup without discipline, right? Astronauts don't go into space without discipline. Uh, uh, Elon Musk doesn't make million, billions of dollars without discipline. College students don't graduate, right, without discipline. Otherworldly people uh, don't live otherworldly without the discipline of prayer. Now, as a side note, turn my Bible here to Matthew chapter six. As a side note, I'll just let you in on the inside. One of the most annoying things about preaching, and there's, there's several, uh, but one of the most annoying things about preaching is you have so much, I mean, like you're studying for this all week. You've got so much in your heart. You've got so much in your mind, but you can't say it all. And it's that dumb clock, right? I only have so much time and someday when I get to heaven, I'll finally have all the time in the world, but you'll know everything, so it won't matter anyways and I'll be annoyed anyways, right? That's what I felt like this week when I was like, studying this passage in the reality, in the necessity, in the privilege of prayer. The Bible has so much to say on prayer. And prayer is just simply communication with God, isn't it? Let's not make it hard. Let's not make it complex. It is communing. It is fellowship with the Father. It's a relationship-driven uh, communication. And Jesus himself has so much to say about prayer. In fact, as you, as you read through the Gospels, I hope, I hope you've caught this in John. As you read through the Gospels, you see that his teaching on prayer isn't all in one place. Now, we're gonna be in one place this morning, but this isn't the only place Jesus talks about prayer. It's all over, all throughout. He's weaving prayer all throughout. He's sprinkling prayer all throughout his ministry. And I was thinking about this this week. As far as we know, the only thing the disciples ever came to Jesus and said was, Lord, teach us to pray. I mean, Jesus did a bunch of great miracles, but they didn't come up to him and go, hey, teach us how to do some miracles. Uh, Jesus cast out a lot of demons. That was one of the mainstays of his ministry. As far as we know, they didn't go, hey, like, teach us how to do that. They had a front row seat to all that Jesus Christ was, and they said, Lord, we need to know how to pray. And their conclusion was that thing that we've got to figure out is that prayer thing. Now, when we look at Matthew chapter 6, this is, this is uh, uh, God's kingdom. This is Jesus' kingdom manifesto, and we're kind of right in the middle of it. And we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 15 these next uh, two weeks. But I want to read, actually, let's read the whole thing, Matthew chapter 6, uh, 5 through 15. And then we're going to spend our time this morning uh, on verses 5 all the way down through verse 8. But let's just read this whole chunk. Jesus says he's teaching the disciples. He's teaching the people around him. There are crowds around him. There are religious leaders around him. His disciples were around him. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you that they have received their reward, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Big idea this morning is that as we look at this text and we look into what, what is this, what does the Holy Spirit want us to get? The big idea, the main thought this morning is that prayer is the privilege and the necessity of all otherworldly people. In fact, there's really two things going on here in this big idea. Some of you uh, don't pray because you don't see it as a privilege. And I, and I want you to know today that it is a privilege of every single otherworldly person. You, you get to pray. You, you get to have access to the king of the universe. You get to come boldly before his throne of grace and receive mercy in your time of need. You don't need a priest. You don't need a papacy. You don't need a go-between. You go directly to him. It's a privilege. And some of you don't think it's a privilege, but some of you don't think it's a need. Like, I don't really need this. And Jesus is saying, yes, you need to pray. And, and this in this passage, he's laying out that prayer is the way of otherworldly people. So the implied question this morning is, okay, so how do we do this? How do we, how do we pray? And uh, I, wanna, I wanna submit to you that there are five otherworldly frameworks in this section of scripture, uh, five through 15. We're gonna take three of them uh, this morning. We're gonna take the, the, the final two next week, but uh, there are five frameworks for prayer. We're gonna hit the first three, and here's the first one. Here's how we'll say it. If this is true, if this is true, how should we pray? Well, as otherworldly people, number one, we pray in actuality, not in theory. We pray in actuality, not in theory. Like this is not a, this is not a like sort of talk about it thing and I understand prayer, but I never do it. This is, I actually pray. This is not an option. Look at what Jesus says in verse five. When you pray, he's talking right now to his disciples. He's saying, when you pray, and he says it again in verse six, and he says it again in verse seven, and then in verse nine, he says, pray then like this. So let's just clear the deck here for a moment, okay? Part of what may, what may be going on in the battle of our otherworldly life is that it's a theory to pray for you. It's not an actuality. You have trusted Jesus, you have a relationship with the Father, but you are not taking advantage of this great benefit. It's actually a theory to you. It's not, a, it's not an actuality. You actually don't engage with the God of heaven. It's a theory. You have unique lines of communication that are ours because of Jesus Christ. But you don't use them. And I want to shepherd you this morning, and I want to exhort you this morning that there are all kinds of reasons why it's difficult to pray. There are all kinds of reasons why it's not an actuality, actually, in my life. There are all kinds of reasons why it's a theory. theory. I've, I've touched on one of them. Flesh shuns prayer. Prayer's dependence. Prayer is a spiritual thing. Prayer is a discipline. I was reading Martin Lloyd-Jones this week. Listen to what he said. He said this. He said, everything we do in the Christian life is easier than prayer. Isn't that great? It's true. The flesh shuns prayer. You'd think it would be the easiest thing ever. I mean, anybody ever go to Starbucks and have a coffee with a friend and just kind of hang out and talk and suddenly four hours go by? Why can't we do that with the Lord? I would love that with Martin Lloyd-Jones. Here's Thomas Shepard. He says, there are times, he actually said this. There are times in my life when I would rather die than pray. We face lots of problems when it comes to praying. We have a distracted mind. We have a weak will. We have a cold heart. We have a conscience plagued by shame. That's why many of us don't pray. In actuality, 
We don't see it really as a necessity, as a need. We don't embrace it as a privilege. We take a lot for granted today, don't we? Seems like we do. Technical advances that were once life changers are now like staples to us, right? They're so hard for us to imagine, but, but there was a first day when there was no, when electricity kind of came onto the scene. Like we've had it all our lives. There was, there was a first day when we actually had running water. There was a first day when we, were, when we had all these advances and even the internet. I mean, we take that for granted today, right? Remember the first, first time we heard about the internet? It was just so mind-blowing and radical. But now these, these are privileges, right? But now they're expected. And I think that I know that in my life, the same could be said of prayer. Prayer is not an unalienable right like voting when you get to turn 18. It's a privilege. It's a blood-bought privilege for those who trust and treasure Jesus. It's a way, listen to this. This will, this will help you pray in actuality. Prayer is actually a way God has chosen to work out what he has planned through, he has chosen through his sovereign will to work out what he has planned through the faithful prayers of his people. Your, your prayers are not outside of his sovereign plan. Rather, they're a crucial part of the working out of his plan for the world. So Jesus says, when you pray. In other words, like actually pray. Don't, don't just say you're going to pray, but not pray. Don't just... Don't just agree with the Bible on the importance and the critical nature of our relationship communally, familiarly with the Father, but actually do pray. Pray in actuality, not in theory. Here's the second thing. So as otherworldly people, we pray not only in actuality, but we pray in relationship, not performance. We pray in relationship. So as I said earlier, Jesus is in the middle of a sermon He's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. He's been preaching to a bunch of people and he's really giving what he's doing. It's his kingdom manifesto. He's giving his uh, kingdom standard and his message has like three points. In verse five, the point number one, he's like, your theology is messed up. In chapter six and seven are the other two points. Chapter six and seven, he's like, second point is like, your approach generally to life is mess, messed up and your uh, religious system is messed up, and he attacks that, and he gives the kingdom standard, and what he's doing in the Sermon on the Mount, he's actually kicking the chair out from underneath them, and he's saying when it comes to giving, when it comes to uh, praying, when it comes to fasting, and here, when it comes to praying, it's a show. It's a facade. You're phonies. That's what he's calling them. When you pray, he's saying, in other words, when, he, when you pray, it's not based on relationship, it's just one big performance. Now, you have to understand something about the Jewish tradition. I mean, no nation has ever had a higher standard of prayer than Israel. They had a priority place for prayer. But, but over, over time, a bunch of faults crept in. Uh, there's just, I'll just list a couple of them. There are more than this. But number one, they became very ritualistic, very routine, if you were a Jew, for example, uh, in the morning and at night, you would pray the Shema. You can go to Deuteronomy 6 and 11, Numbers 15. You can see the Shema, and you would, whether you were at home in the field, at work, whether you were on a journey or in the synagogue or visiting friends, you would, at the appointed time, you would stop whatever you were doing and you would offer an appropriate prayer. And there was a lot more. They even had a condensed version of it if you were really in a hurry. But there, there, there's just a lot more prayers than that one. But, but their system became very ritualistic. This is kind of just what we do and very flippant, very superficial. Secondly, they got really long. They got really long. If you've ever been, if you've ever had that person in your family, you know what I'm talking about. They act like they get paid by the word for prayer. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> they intend to make a good in income, especially at Thanksgiving. We all have that uncle at Thanksgiving who won't stop praying. And it's like, hey, hey, I don't want Thanksgiving at breakfast. I want it actually at dinner. Can you please stop praying? 
We, we've all got that family member. Mark 12, Jesus actually hits on the Pharisees. He hits them between the eyes, and he says, for show, for pretense, you pray, you make long prayers. There's nothing wrong with long prayers. If they're real prayers, if you're trying to impress everybody with big words, if you're trying to impress everybody with your theology, with your fluency, whatever, Jesus is attacking that. He's confronting that. So you can see Jesus is confronting them. And he says that when you pray, you must not be like, look at what it says. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Hypocrite is, a, is the word for actor. It's a play actor. It means you're good at acting. You're good at mimicking. You're, you're good at appearing to be something you aren't. And tradition, uh, Jewish tradition had reduced prayer to play acting. You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand. Do you see that in the text? They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners. Now, stand, it carries the idea of I'm going to make my mark. I'm going to uphold my authority. Oh, boy, do I've got a doozy. I've got some words people haven't heard before. Wait till they hear these. Now, look at the issue. What's the issue here? The issue is that they may be seen by others. That's that's the motive. Instead of it being about God, which prayer is, they made it about themselves. It was all about them. It was all about getting noticed. It was all about getting the praise of men. They were using God to get glory for themselves. And Jesus' response to that is, truly, I say to you, they have their reward. That's your whole thing. If that's how you choose to pray, that's your reward. You get seen by a few people. One or two people are impressed. That's it. If you pray because you love it when people see you being spiritual, if your public prayer exceeds your private prayer, if you prefer it that way, well, Jesus says, that's your reward. So convicting, isn't it? So challenging. And and I I wanna say something to every single one of you and even myself included. We lean towards Pharisee. I mean, how how many people look at this text and go, well, that's a Pharisee. I mean, that's a Pharisee. Well, we lean towards Pharisee. We lean towards it. I lean towards it. Sometimes we don't pray to God. We, we pray instead in front of an audience, for an audience, to an audience, for the approval of others. What does the Bible say? Man looks at outward appearance. Oh, look at them. They dress very religious. They dress very, they act very religious. Man, they've got really good prayers. They've got long prayers. Boy, they, they use big words. Religious people love big words, don't they? Shekinah. It's like, what? What? <laughs> You know what I mean? Like like they use random words in their prayer to show off so that people would be impressed by them, always searching for words you've never heard before. Jesus says, when you, when you, when you pray, don't be like that. Don't pray to try to impress people, deceive people, convince people, trust me, I'm godly. Don't pray like that. It's not a show. Here it is. He says, when you pray, look at verse six, go somewhere, private, shut the door, and your father who sees you in secret will reward you. Now, does Jesus have a hang up with public prayer? I hope not, because we pray publicly a lot, right? Does he have a hang up with small groups and couples praying? He, He certainly doesn't. He's just saying this. He's saying, if your motive, listen, If your motive for public prayer is not driven by your motive for private prayer, it is pretense. That's what he's saying. Now think about that with me for a moment. Private prayer is really the only thing you don't see in the Christian life. You don't see private prayer. Um, You see giving. You see forgiveness. You see acts of worship. You don't see private prayer in secret is not seen. The motive for praying in secret is simply to know God better. That's what Jesus is getting at. He's getting at relationship. He's saying that there's no fakes in secret. 
I mean, who goes and gets by themselves in a room and closes the door and gets on their knees to fake it? Like, this just doesn't happen. And what Jesus is saying, the litmus test for the genuineness of your spiritual life is actually what is happening secretly. That makes sense? The litmus test for the genuineness of your spiritual life is actually what is happening secretly. Everything else that happens in your, in your spiritual life, God's sense of genuineness of that is based upon what you do with God in private. Your private prayer is the fuel for your corporate prayer. Your private prayer is the cultivation of a relationship that flows, flows out from you corporately. Such a great acid test for hypocrisy. It's pretty convicting. Here's the third framework. Third framework for otherworldly prayer, and then we're going to stop here this morning. Prayer is the privilege and the necessity of all otherworldly people. How then, how then should we pray? Pray in actuality, not in theory. Like actually pray. Pray in relationship, not in performance. This isn't a performance. This isn't the, the flares up the God somehow that he'll be impressed with some big words. This isn't that. This isn't trying to impress the audience and trying to get acceptance from people and trying to show people how religious I am and how much of a hot shot I am. That is not at all what prayer is about. And also prayer, number three, praying confidence, not manipulation. Praying confidence. When you pray, Jesus says, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard in their many words. Now, most, uh, most Gentiles were polytheists back then. They worshiped many gods. So this is like, this, this was a whole system uh, of communication predicated on intense repetition. Why? Because they hoped to impress the God they were praying to and if not impress him, at least wear him out. And so they would pray, and they would use words and words upon words. But you remember, remember Elijah's show, showdown in uh, 1 Kings 18? That's a great story, and that's a great example of what I'm talking about. You had 450 prophets of Baal on Mount, Mount Carmel challenging one prophet of God, Elijah. And Elijah says, listen, let's both pray to our God. And whoever sends down fire, he is God. And Elijah's like, you go first. And all day, you know the story, right? First Kings 18. If not, write it down, read it. You'll love it, okay? All day, they're, they're praying. They're praying. They're screaming. They're using all kinds of words and intense repetition. And then they start cutting themselves and throwing themselves on the ground. And it was just chaos. And then Elijah has a stand-up routine, and he just starts making fun of them. And he's like, hey, maybe he's out back using the outhouse. Well, you know, who knows? And, uh, and then what happens? Elijah just gets up there, and he prays to his God, and God sends down fire and consumes the altar and consumes the prophets. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. This is... The idea here, this is manipulation. And instead of manipulation, the confidence that's juxtaposed against that is the confidence, Jesus says it here in verse 7 and 8, that a son or a daughter should have in their father, a father who loves them and a father who cares for them. And specifically in this text, verse 8, your father knows He already knows what I need even before I know that I need it. Isn't that awesome? That should be our confidence, that I pray to a God who actually knows what I need before I even know I need it. Um, Years ago, it was probably five or six years ago, I took Gabe out on a dad date. And uh, we went to the seafood restaurant. We both like seafood. And then we were going to go to the movie. It was some superhero movie. I can't remember. And we went in and we sat down and we had this great meal. And we walk outside together. We're just kind of walking to the car, having fun. We're going to go to the movie. 
we're, 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 we're discussing our plan and some woman starts running out of the restaurant with a bunch of stuff in her hands. She's like, sir, sir, I think this is your stuff. And if you know me, this happens all the time. It was literally my sunglasses, my car keys, my wallet, my baseball cap, and my leftovers. I had no clue. I mean, I would have had a clue in like 20 seconds, but I had no clue. I had no clue I had a need, but she knew I had a need before I even knew I had a need. And this is what Jesus is saying. Your father knows what you need even before you ask. And so you come to the one who's fully informed. Isn't that awesome? That should spike up your confidence. You come to the one who is fully informed, and that's the incentives. He, he knows more about you than you do. He knows all the contingencies that you don't know. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the future as well as the past, as well as the present. And it's all in perfect harmony with the working out of his plan. Yet, yet, we're told to come as a privilege and as a necessity. We're, come to, we're told to come and pour out our hearts and watch how he hears and watch how he answers our prayers, even, even, even when they are, uh, even when they uh, doesn't doesn't seem like they're coming true or it doesn't seem like they're coming uh, answered in a way that we want them to be answered. He he comes and he answers and they're consistent with his will and he weaves all these little issues into our lives into the fulfillment of his own eternal purpose. I don't have to twist his arm. I don't have to say, somehow trick him. I don't have to say a magic word to get him to look at me. He's my father who knows and who loves me. Which is, which is incredible, because when you read Matthew, God has been silent for a long, long time. And when you read Matthew up until this point in history, God is not commonly referred to as Father. I think there's 14 times in the Old Testament. 14 times in the Old Testament. Every time it's a national, it's a national thing. It's not an individual. And Jesus comes along and over 165 times in all four Gospels, Father, 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 Father. Father, how great is that? It's his favorite title for God, Father. Those who have been transformed in their hearts through faith in Jesus Christ have open access to God as Father. I know for many it's hard to think of a father who's willing because of the failings of our own fathers. I, I'm not ignorant to not think that there are any people out here who, who've, who've had really bad relationships with their father. Their father was not protective, not loving, not gentle, not faithful, but harsh and unwilling and inconsistent. Yet when Jesus Christ says your fathers, he's saying this. He says, like, listen, don't pray like them. Pray like this. Pray our father. So instead of measuring God by the standard of human father, you measure human fathers by the standard of God the father. And let me just say this, Dad, you and I, all dads in here, you and I could really help our kids learn a lot about prayer if the requests that are made our way come to us and then we respond. We could teach our kids a lot about how God responds to requests, that if requests come our way, we actually respond to them. The big idea here and the confidence driver here is that sometimes you just really need to get your dad involved. The good news is you and I have got a heavenly father and we count on our heavenly father and we can depend on our heavenly father and that is the privilege we have. And as children, we need a father. Lines of communication open for us a necessity, and a privilege. I want to end with this, and we're going to be done. Susanna Wesley, uh, she uh, had 12 kids. She was the wife of John Wesley, and she had 12 kids, and she had made a commitment to the Lord, and she didn't have much time, right? She originally made a commitment to the Lord that every hour I spend in entertainment, I spend on my knees. 
but she didn't really spend any time in entertainment because she had 12 kids. And so she had this like prayer apron. And every time she would sit down in her kitchen with her apron over her head, the kids knew that she was with God. That was her sign to them that she was meeting with God. That was her secret place to meet with the Lord. In a little house with 12 kids, she created a place. And the kids knew not to mess with her when the apron was over her head. It was like her little meeting tent. It was her little place to commune and read the word and pray for her family and pray for her husband, her kids. It's where she met with the Lord in prayer. She got this. She understood. She actually prayed, not in theory, but in actuality. She prayed in relationship, not in performance. She didn't try to manipulate God or anything like that. Instead, she prayed in confidence. And I'm telling you, she had an incredible, incredible ministry. Read about her. Susanna Wesley, may that, be, may that be us, may that be Christ Church in an effort to live out what we've learned. I have three questions for you. Number one, number one, which prayer should be mine today? Which prayer should be mine today? Maybe your prayer should be a prayer of concession. It's a prayer of surrender. Uh, It's surrendering to Christ. Christ is the only way to the Father, and I've not yet surrendered my life to the Lord. Maybe that's your prayer this morning. You need to admit that you are a sinner, and you need to come before the Lord in humility and bow before him and say, my life is yours. Take it. Maybe that's your prayer this morning. Maybe you've prayed that prayer, and as a Christian, your prayer is more of a prayer of confession, maybe a confession for a lack of desire for God, maybe a confession that you've been arrogant, that you have been independent. Maybe it's a confession of unforgiveness and some relational strife and conflict that you haven't resolved in your life. Whatever it is, maybe that's what you need to pray this morning. Maybe others of you, you've been praying, and yours is a prayer of continuance. You've been walking in prayer, and you're like, what what should I pray today? And I would just say, pray again. Keep going. Keep praying. Number two, what obstacles to prayer must I remove? Maybe you need time without your phone. Maybe, Maybe that's what you need. Maybe your phone is an obstacle. Maybe social media is an obstacle. Maybe you need to go to bed earlier. Maybe you need to watch one less show. Maybe you need to confess areas that are blocking a familial relationship with God. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe it's busyness. Maybe it's some unresolved, harbored up sin. Maybe it's a relational conflict. Remove those obstacles. Like shut off the noise, practically. You know what I mean? Like shut off the noise. Get quiet before the Lord. Some of you haven't been quiet in a long, long time, and maybe that's for you this morning. You need to shut off the distractions and shut off the noise and just get quiet before the Lord with your Bible open. Get focused. Get focused. Get God's word out. Start praying scripture for your own life and for the lives of others. Pray. Take a deliberate action to remove those obstacles to prayer. And finally, does the mission of my life even require prayer? Do I even desire a holy life? Is there there even a courage and a boldness in me that is beyond me that I actually believe I need? Or is my view of mission so timid and so small, it doesn't even require prayer? Like, is the mission of my life, is the mission of Jesus Christ and the mission of my life, are those even paired up in a way that requires prayer? Prayer.